Look at the question team. The Mass Effect one should be 15. I only missed one point. <laughs> well, you can fully interpret the Mass Effect, and then by fully I mean all of the peaks that are major that I'll list. I list the one you have to. Say the cation and the fragmentation pattern. Um, but I'm not going to give anybody any help. So you're on your own on that one. It'll be due on Friday for a chance to make up five points. And if you got a good score on that, you can still fully interpret it. Because even though you got a good score, you may not have had the right cations listed. And I didn't re request all of them. So it's just an open-ended. Anybody can get up to five points on that. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, I now know what the actual structure is. I think I drew it in. Yeah, I chose the brown one. Yeah. I chose the brown one. And you have oh, to do the calculation the properly. That was one thing people uh, missed was using the wrong base set for the calculation. You start with a diene when it's... That would make sense. Oh, it or you, yeah, you use the diene number when it's not. or. Um, for the first human this question, a lot of people use the uh, ester number, but the ester is actually on the opposite side, so it's not conjugated that way. It's through the oxygen, so that's actually a diene instead of an ester in the calculation. So just knowing what base set to use. When you're looking at something that has a carbonyl, if it's conjugated, it has to be conjugated with the double bond, like so. So this would be a base set of some type of carbonyl, but the one where it has the oxygen off of it, it's just a diene for that calculation. Um, Are you just going to repost just the blank yeah, mass I'll back? I'll have a one page just with that question, what I just told you for the instructions. Okay.
what room? Come to my office. I think it's going to be in 201 unless I get too many people in the lot to figure out where to go because all the classrooms are going to be busy at that point. So we'll figure something out. Meet me in my office. And your homework will be posted today. So on Friday we left off with doing calculations of chemical shifts of carbons in a molecule. We're going to continue on with that and then go into protons a little bit as well. So we were looking at the molecule Spectrum on the next slide, you can see there is 
these are the other two carbons that we didn't calculate. And then we see three aromatic peaks, one at about, what were our values? So our B carbon is showing up at 113. Our two peaks at 129 are showing up in the same place, so we only see one there. And then we have the A carbon, where it's directly attached to the methoxy at 157 there. Essentially, just you know, take it piece by piece, pay attention on these to what hydrogen you're looking at, and then the relationships. So we're not, these are para-substituted, but when we're looking at a hydrogen or a carbon here, we need to know what the relationship is between those positions. Okay. Well, then we're going to do some other calculations. The straight chain, if you're just looking at a standard alkane, you can use this system. And this is when there are no substituents attached to the alkane chain. And I color coded this. We're going to focus on this carbon here being our central carbon. And then we're going to list our alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, just going away from it, basically counting how far away from that system we are. And we'll use this to do calculations. You can see there's a slight cut correction for how many alpha carbons you have, then a correction for how many beta carbons you have, gamma, delta, epsilon. And then there's what's called the steric corrections, which we'll use this table for, but it'll be better when we go through a calculation. I'm just wondering, is it positive or negative for the minus 2.5? It is 2. supposed 5? to be negative on that Okay. One. Yeah, that's actually where the negative came from on the other slide, was I copied this equation and I color coded it and then didn't change that. So the alpha and the beta carbons are actually going to slightly increase the chemical shift of a carbon, but then having a gamma substituent is going to slightly decrease it. Okay. Yeah. And this is all just based on taking lots of data and figuring out how it correlates with different molecules. So let's do this for a simple alkene structure. And they chose a substituted butane so that we would only have to do two calculations. So this structure, even though it has six carbons, has only two different carbons. And we're talking about magnetic equivalents. So we have symmetry within the molecule such that all the methyl groups are the same and the two methyne groups are the same. So we'll do the calculations on these. And first we're going to look at A. When we look at A, it has, well first off, let's label these primary, tertiary, tertiary, primary, primary, That'll be important later. And then I'm going to redraw the structure. Focusing on A here, and I'm just going to start counting. So we've got our alpha, beta, gamma, gamma, and then this is beta as well. Because you just start with each alpha and you count to the end of each chain, basically. So we're looking at carbon A here. Oh, I see. And the relationship between this methyl group and this one is beta. Even though they're the same when they show up on the NMR, when we're looking at one in particular, it still has a beta substituent. And these are gamma in relation to it. They're all going to be affected the same way. If I was to look at this one, it would still have one beta and two gammas. If I looked over here, we'd have one beta, two gammas. So it doesn't matter which one you choose if they're equivalent there. So our first, we start with 
negative 2.3 parts per million. And then we add for the beta. Oh, yeah, there's a <laughs> women in science engineering panel. I don't really want that on my slide. Okay, I'll work around it. Um, on Thursday, if you're interested, they have several people coming to talk about <laughs> women in science. Sorry about that. So now we're going to correct for the number of alpha carbons there are. There is one alpha carbon, so we have 9.1 times 1 for alpha carbons. Then we're going to add 9.4 for the number of beta carbons. So we have 9.4 times 2 for the number of beta carbons we have. Then we're going to subtract. 2.5 for the number of gamma carbons, and we've got two gamma carbons. The last thing we need to do is correct for the steric corrections. So we're going to look at carbon A, and carbon A is a primary carbon, so this is the atom observed, and it is primary, and then we want to look at its neighbor and see what its substituent is, so this is now tertiary here. So the tertiary one, if we have a primary with the tertiary next to it, it's going to have a slight steric correction. Um, negative 1.1 for the primary being next to a tertiary. And then we add that all up and we get 19.5 parts per million. The actual value on this one is 19.5. We'll go through the same thing with B. Actually, why don't you work through B with your neighbors, and then I'll write it up on the board. Because those ones are primaries. Yeah. And by primaries, I mean secondaries. What? Aren't those secondaries? No, it's a primary. That's a primary. Those are primaries. Never mind. I can't do that. <laughs> don't, don't mess with me, woman. It takes a lot of work to count sometimes. <laughs> Whoa. 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 I was warned that this was going to be a problem. Yay. I pushed and divided my thing making noise right before us. I said eight. I said eight. What is the answer supposed to be, Brendan? Because you have a calculator. Oh. Does your thing follow order of operation? Okay. 
Let me see him boy. No. I have to put everything in parentheses. Seems low. I also just feel better doing it that way. But who goes that way? There you go. Let's pull that way. Oh, he has that 2.7 times 2. That's fine. You don't need 3.7 times 2. I, why would you There's need two primaries and one tertiary? Yeah, but where are you getting the primaries need a 3.7? The primary it's a primary next to it. But you go sideways. Oh, did I go this way and then that way? Yeah. Oh. Oh, well, then that way. Yeah. Yeah. I say, like, why are you messing with me, bud? Yeah. I think this is what you do. Okay. How many alphas do we have? Three? Three. I've labeled them here. Alpha, alpha, alpha. How many betas do we have? Two. How many gammas? None. We don't continue on after that. Now the tricky part. How do we determine the steric correction factors? What, do we, what is B? Tertiary. Tertiary. What is this alpha? Primary. Primary. <laughs> Tertiary. All right. Now we got it labeled. Now we have to figure out how to use this table. And so we have a tertiary next to a primary times two. And then we have a tertiary next to a tertiary. Remember that you look at the carbon atom observed here. So if it's tertiary and it's next to a primary? Zero. Zero. So this equals zero. The tertiary next to a tertiary is... 8.5? And when we add that all together, we get 34.3. Or but then delta and epsilon. Yeah, you can go for it. So. Parts per million, the actual value going to be 34.5 parts per million. So, so what if it was next to, how does it, how does it factor in when it's like a tertiary next to a primary multiplied by two? You multiply. You would do, add that twice. Okay. Yeah, so if it was, if there were, say, a tertiary next to a secondary and there were two of them, you would add negative 3.7 twice. Okay. Angry. This works the same for cyclooctanes. Cyclooctanes, um, I think these are just linear. Linear octanes. Now, and that's only what you want to use when there's no substitution. If there's substitution, we're going to use base values, which are on the next slide. And we're going to do a couple calculations for the substituted alkanes. So at least get us started drawing out the structure we're going to look at. And it looks like that's going to start back up again, I hope. So again, I'll do the first one and then I'll have you do the second one. So we're going to look at 2,3-butane diol. Different values. 
And so we need to choose the first, uh, choose the right structure for our base values. So we're going to use butane. In this case, this is C1 and this is C2. And then we have C2 and C1 again. And then we're going to be looking at substituents. Uh, in this case, we have the OH group on an internal carbon. So we will use the internal values here. And then we have the OH. And we will determine alpha, beta, and gamma from there. So again, we have just two A and B. So we will do A. And that's going to start with our base value of C1, which is the 13.4 parts per million. Then we have two different OH groups. I'm going to label them OH1 and OH2. And I'm going to draw this structure out again. That would be a. Let me label this right. Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at this carbon. Yep. So this is alpha. We're looking at this carbon. So whatever would be attached to this carbon would be considered alpha. Oh. It'll make sense in a second when I start putting <laughs> the values in. This is beta. This is gamma. When we're looking at carbon A, the OH group. For number one is going to be beta. This OH group, number one, is beta. So we'll use the correction of the OH in a beta position. So plus eight. Then we're going to have the OH in position number two. And it Position number two is a gamma substituent. And then we will subtract five from the value. We don't do the start correction factor because that's already done in getting the base value of 13.4 for our butane. So that's already accounted for. So when we add this all up, we will get 16.4 parts per million. The actual value is going to be 16.96 parts per million. And this one was a gamma substituent. Make sense now? So you start counting at the alpha that the carbon you're looking at, and then you see what the relationship is. So try it with, for carbon 2, C2 here. Which we'll label as B. Does that mean that B is now alpha? Yes. That carbon now here is alpha. So try that calculation, and then we'll compare our values.
If we had had like another methyl though, and it you'd want to been... use a pentane or there's a big table of them. But as far as like if it had been alpha inst instead of having one of those alcohols, if and it there had was been group yeah, here. yeah. So you either need to use the if you can find the correct structure, <coughs> or there is a methyl substituent here. So if you need to make that correction, you can. And the actual value on this is 70.98 parts per million. And there's the actual structure. Again, very simple. We've got something right around 16 and something around 70. So far we've only done carbon calculations, we're going to run through one proton calculation, but it essentially works the same way. So you can also calculate the chemical shifts of a proton if you have the right data set. And in here, again, make a correction on your slide if it doesn't have it already, that that should be plus para, not minus para. All of those are additive. And we'll go through a very simple to proton calculation again. That's where benzene shows up on a spectrum. So that will be our base value for an aromatic proton. And then we're going to add in corrections for the acid chloride substituent and then the chloro substituent. Our acid chloride substituent for proton A has an ortho relationship. And so we're going to add 0 0.76, because that's ortho. And our chlorine from A has a meta relationship, and so we will use the negative 0 0.07. Note these are much smaller values than we had for carbon because it's a smaller chemical shift range that we're looking at. So we're looking at decimal places rather than whole numbers for most of these.
next time because I don't have to do too much mental gym gymnastics to get this. So for B, our acid chloride substituent, what should we add? Point zero one six. One six. One six, yeah, because it's now meta. And then for the chlorine, what are we going to add? Minus point oh two. Impossible. Yeah, the very low probability that we'd actually see two carbons in the carbon 13s in the same molecule that are neighboring each other. So, unlikely. In carbon 13, however, we do see heteronuclear coupling. So, instead of hydrogen hydrogen, we would see hydrogen carbon. So, your proton. Carbon. This one's very common and actually somewhat problematic, so we'll talk about how we get rid of that. You also see phosphorus, carbon, or fluorine, carbon. Any nuclei that is NMR active can potentially split the carbons. Another 
fluorine in your structure, you could see fluorine hydrogen coupling in a proton NMR. These are elements that are not very common, so we don't see them very much. But if they are, then we cause splitting. We actually talked a little bit about the hydrogen 1 C13 coupling when we were looking at proton N marks. I showed you the little tiny peaks that show up on the outside, and that's from the carbon splitting the proton. When we're looking at carbon, that becomes more relevant because now every single carbon 13 is likely going to have a hydrogen that can split it and that would split our hydrogen signals. And it splits them by about 100 to 250 hertz, which is a fairly large coupling constant. If you were to take a proton coupled C13 NMR, they get rather complicated. And there's an example from your book, which I have a slide of, where the top one is actually a proton coupled C13. And you actually see the same type of splitting patterns we would see for proton-proton splitting. So this carbon has three hydrogens attached to it, so it's split into a quartet. This one is two hydrogens attached to it, so it's split into a triplet. Same with this one. And then our aromatic region gets a little bit quite complicated because we have a bunch of doublets overlapping each other and possibly longer range splitting as well. We Take that away, though, in most of our spectra. You'll notice one thing is that your signal to noise here is a lot lower on the proton coupled because when you split that peak into three or four, then all of the peaks are going to be a lot shorter and your noise is going to be more significant. They overlap, making things complicated, and our signal to noise isn't as good, and so usually we just get rid of the proton coupling by doing a proton decoupled NMR. When we were talking about proton NMR, we talked about how we acquired it. So we take our sample and we irradiate it with a short pulse of energy, the radio waves, and that excites some of the protons, and then we stop irradiating it and we observe it as it's going along. So carbon, we're gonna do the same thing. So we're going to look at the carbon, we're going to irradiate it, and then we're going to have our signal here where we're actually acquiring it. what it would look like for a normal proton couple C13. But if we want to get rid of the splitting, we need to basically saturate the hydrogen sample. We want to get them actually super excited so they're flipping so fast that the carbon doesn't see the difference between the two spin states. And we take a second channel. So now we have another channel that we're going to do some <coughs> magnetic our radio waves, and in this case for the hydrogen, we're actually just going to get them excited the entire time we're collecting the spectra. And it's just a very long pulse. Remember, we're talking about two different ranges of radio waves, so for this carbon, you have a short pulse of the 100 megahertz, but the 400 megahertz signal is just going to be kind of constantly going, and you have two different channels that you're doing these on. This is going to saturate the proton signal. In lab, we actually did something kind of like this with our water signal last um, lab rotation because we were trying to get rid of the water signal, so we were just specifically looking at the water and we were exciting it. And when you completely saturate a signal, it means that you have equal number of protons in the upper state as in the lower state. So now N upper is going to be equal to N lower. When this happens, we now no longer have a 
difference in the two energy states, and we don't see that signal anymore. And for carbon, it actually takes away the spin-spin splitting from the hydrogen and the carbon. And now our signals are nice singlets, which give us better signal-to-noise ratio, and we can now interpret these carbons here in the middle that were split and overlapping a little bit better. It takes away some of our information, though. In the proton coupled, we can then tell how many hydrogens are attached to which carbons. And so we've taken away a little bit of information, but really we gained enough that it's worthwhile. It also means that you can take a sample much faster. In fewer scans, you get a nice clean spectrum rather than waiting longer to get a better signal to noise on that first one. This proton decoupled NMR has two effects. The first one is that removal of splitting, as I was mentioning. And so all of the ages are flipping so fast. longer have the instance where you have the hydrogen in a upstate so the carbon feels slightly uh, deshielded versus in the downstate where it's slightly shielded. Now they're going so fast that it sees the average of them and it puts it back into the single peak in the middle. The other effect is a little bit more complicated. It's called the nuclear overhauser effect or the NOE. It's usually abbreviated all capital letters or just the O in the middle having a capital letter since that's the name that it's based on. So you'll see that either way. In the NOE, this is actually a through space interaction. So you, one hydrogen or carbon feels another one through space. It's not a through bond. And so this can be used in a couple ways. It can be used to actually determine how closely things are positioned in a proton NMR. So if you irradiate one of them, you can actually see if there's another proton way over on another side of the molecule that happens to be folded close to it. So it's good for conformational changes and things like that. But what we're going to look at is for, for carbon. So this is actually a through space, not through bonds. And it's very sensitive to uh, distance. So if R is the distance between our two nuclei, then it's proportional to a 1 over R to the 6th power, or NOE is. So it has to be pretty close to see this effect. But when you have a carbon directly attached to a hydrogen, they are very close. These saturated protons are going to cause the carbons to redistribute. So remember that we need our Boltzmann distribution of having more spins in the lower spin state compared to the upper spin state in order to see the transition. Your book goes into a rather complicated explanation of this, but I'm just going to say that the fact that the hydrogens now have equalized between the two spin states causes there to be actually a few more carbons in the lower spin state rather than the upper spin state. It helps separate out those energy levels so you get a little bit more difference, which means you get a stronger signal, hence the enhancement in nuclear overhauser enhancement. We get more carbon in the lower spin state. Uh, if they're equal, how are we're talking carbon here. This was the proton. Okay. Yep. Okay. So our protons are now equal, but this actually. 
actually causes more carbon in a lower spin state. Which helps with our observations, so we have more of them to get excited into the upper spin state and then watch them relax back down into the lower spin state. The effect of this is that it's going to enhance our carbon-13 signal.